President for Global Academic Initiatives, Arizona State University. And what a pertinent topic uh, we have today, higher education in a time of COVID. And we are also being joined by our Group Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Gurinder Singh, sir, who has motivated us since this uh, lockdown uh, for doing these webinars and for getting the great minds from the academic fraternity on this platform, uh, which enables them to speak to us, to our students, uh, to our faculties, and can share their thoughts and their views. Uh, I will quickly go through a brief profile of Dr. Lindquist. Dr. Lindquist became Senior Vice President of Global Academic Initiatives at Arizona State University in November of 2019, where she facilitates ASU's Global Academic Portfolio. Prior to taking that position, she served as Deputy Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs and Foundation Professor of Law and Political Science at ASU from 2016 to 2019. She served as Dean and Arch Professor at UGA's School of Public and International Affairs from 2013 to 2016, after serving as an Interim Dean, uh, Associate Dean for Outreach, and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Texas School of Law. Prior to teaching at the University of Texas, uh, Professor Linquist taught law and political science at Vanderbilt University. She also served as a visiting faculty member at the University of Southern California Gold School of Law 2013. She is recognized as an expert on the US Supreme Court constitutional law and administrative law. She has co-authored three books and has authored dozens of published articles and book chapters. Her book, Measuring Judicial Activism, is the first publication to define the oft-used term quantitatively. Dr. Linquist was recognized for her exceptional teaching skills at both Van Vanderbilt University, where she was awarded the Robert Berkby Award for Excellence in Teaching Political Science and served as director of the graduate program and at the University of Georgia, where she was named professor of the year 2003 and where she earned its university-wide teaching award in 2002. Professor Linquist oversaw the Temple University Law Review, serving as its editor-in-chief after graduating magna cum laude. She, clerk, uh, she clerked for the Honorable Anthony J. Sareka at the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in, in Philadelphia, and later practiced law at Latham and Watkins in Washington, DC. She also served as a research associate at the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, DC, assisting committees of the Federal Jud uh, Judicial Conference in addressing questions of judicial administration. She earned her Temple JD in 1988 and in 1995, earned her PhD in political science at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Linquist resides in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, before I hand over uh, the session to you, Professor Linquist, uh, may I request our Group Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Gurinder Singh, sir, uh, to say a few words and the opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gaurav. Uh, and what a pleasure to welcome Professor Stephane. I think that it's uh, really a privilege uh, for MIT University uh, to welcome a person of your station. And as uh, uh, our very dear Vice Chancellors, Deans, uh, research scholars and students, you know that we are trying to establish a very close and strategic partnership with Arizona State University. Uh, and I think the topic was uh, very relevant that how uh, all of you, you are uh, feeling uh, today in the area of higher education. And when uh, and before you came, we, we sent a questionnaire to some of our top people and we have got more than 100 questions for you. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> uh, of course, we will not be asking you 100 questions. So, uh, uh, Gora will only be giving you a few, but we will be sending you a summary of uh, the observations which uh, our deans and our students, our research scholars, uh, 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 they have uh, towards the situation. But I think this is a very uh, important question which is in the mind of everyone, that how we are going to face a challenge uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, two to three years. Uh, most of the students, as you know, that uh, we are uh, the largest partner of United States of America. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, the largest, uh, 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 USA is the largest uh, exporter and the largest importer to India. 
uh, and uh, uh, the students in India take US as, as the first destination when they, they think of the higher education. But now for the next six months, uh, they will not be able to travel. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we are not very sure of uh, the next 12 months also. So the students who were already uh, offered the admissions in American universities, who wanted to go to, to US, uh, uh, what they should do? Uh, should they take a gap year? Should they do a part of the program in India and then the part of the program abroad? Uh, 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 how many universities in India will be able to do that? What is in the mind of the uh, American universities? Do they really, are they open to have uh, uh, these kind of arrangements? Uh, will they accept credits? Uh, and if so, how many credits they will be able to give to the students? And will they be able to give online support? And if online support, uh, what they foresee? That uh, how they will be delivering it because there is a time difference. Uh, when we are in evening, you are in morning. Right now, it's evening time in India. Right? It's uh, very early uh, in Arizona. So I think that we need to look at uh, all these things which are very, very important. Uh, most of the students, uh, they are really uh, very keen. And I know that you have done your JD program. Um, quite a few of uh, our law students, particularly, they want to go uh, uh, to US to do their JD programs, to do their uh, advanced law courses. Uh, most of the engineering students, they want to take up technology programs. We are very, very strong in business and economics. So our management students uh, in particular, uh, I think that we have got more than 800 applications where the students want to go to US to do their business and economics programs. Uh, but all of them, they have uh, numerous questions. And I think one of the most important questions which every student uh, and every academic is asking is that how will the higher education look like? And we know that it's not going to be safe. So over to you, we'd like to hear more from you uh, that what you foresee, what is the solution and how India and America, which are in otherwise also a strategic partner, how they will meet these challenges. Over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And it's a real privilege to be here. It's wonderful to meet you, Dr. Grinder and Gaurav. And, um, and it's a privilege to speak with your students and faculty. And I thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I always enjoy speaking with students. I don't get as much of a chance now in my current job to speak with, with students in particular. So it's a real privilege and pleasure for me to do that. Uh, now, I do teach one class in constitutional law, but, um, but this is a real privilege for me. And I was just in India uh, in March, uh, right before the borders were shut down. I was there around March 8th of this year. Uh, and at that time, the uh, government of India was taking people's temperatures in the airport. So it was all, it, the, the, the government was certainly aware of the situation. And I was glad and, and pleased to have been able to get there before the borders shut down. So. Um, really enjoyed my trip uh, to India this last time. Um, and it's, a, it's great to talk to you uh, from Arizona State, I think about this very critical time in higher education. Um, Arizona, one might say that Arizona State, at least, has been preparing for this for the last uh, 16 to 20 years, uh, although we certainly did not necessarily foresee uh, a coronavirus crisis, obviously. Um, although there are some other, some other universities, I'll explain, that actually did foresee this a little bit more specifically. Uh, but we certainly recognize the importance of students' flexibility in being able to learn wherever they are and in whatever stage of their career or educational journey that they're on. And for that reason, we've thought uh, very, very hard about flexible education that really covers a continuum. And I like to think of that continuum as the, what we call the, the uh, on-campus, full immersion, traditional educational uh, uh, modality, which we call kind of the Oxford model, right? Where the student is on the campus, is immersed in the campus experience, and has in-person experiences with faculty members. And that, of course, has been the traditional model. But going forward, that is simply not going to be the model that is going to prevail effectively. Um, first of all, it doesn't scale, right? It doesn't scale. Um, so even aside from the coronavirus, uh, it's important for institutions of higher education to appreciate that they can't, the, the, the principle of exclusivity, where you keep your university small, extremely exclusive, where you reject more students than you admit, 
Um, that has been kind of the elite model of higher education in the United States, in England, in India, and everywhere. Um, but we really do have a burgeoning population of young people who need education. On our estimate, uh, there's about, uh, by the year 2050, there's going to be about 450 million young people around the world who are going to need higher education, and we need to make that available to them. It's extremely important for the future of the human condition, right? For the future of the human race and for our economic well-being, et cetera. It's really important that we enable students to access higher education. And we estimate that if you're gonna follow the traditional model, the Oxford model, as I've mentioned, uh, that it would take about uh, uh, building a 25,000 person university a week for decades to meet that 450 million uh, person demand for higher education. The other thing, aside from coronavirus, is that uh, people need education throughout their lives. I think Amity understands this, uh, we certainly do, that people need to upskill. The world is a swiftly changing place technologically uh, and, and otherwise, right? We are watching history be made in real time in ways that our ancestors could never imagine. And we're watching medical, uh, the evolution of medical solutions to human problems, technical solutions to human problems. These are operating at a really lightning speed. And for that reason, any human being needs to, who wants to engage in the economic engine uh, in their nation and in the world globally, needs to constantly rethink and upskill um, so that they can meet the demands of the economy, of the business world, of uh, whatever profession they choose. And for that reason, uh, we are very keen on thinking about a student's journey, actually from K, what, what, from, the, from the very beginning of their experience as a young person learning, all the way to being a senior citizen. And what kind of learning does uh, a, a person need throughout their lifetime and how can we make that available? So at ASU, and this is true of other global universities too, we have K through 12 education available. We run our own charter schools in the United States, K through 12. We run a, 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 a digital preparatory academy so that you can take courses uh, in high school and junior high school in a digital environment, and you can do that anywhere in the world. And then we even think all the way to the point of senior citizens uh, we've just built a senior citizen living facility on our campus in Tempe. And the reason is we want to bring senior citizens into our community, right, and have our students um, benefit from having uh, senior mentors on the campus. And in addition, the senior citizens themselves, of course, benefit greatly from being on a campus. Um, and it's very energizing for them and engaging for them intellectually. Um, so there's a number of reasons why we need to think flexibly about how we offer education. And the coronavirus has simply accelerated uh, that thinking beyond the traditional Oxford model into something that's far, far more flexible. So at, at, at ASU, uh, about uh, 2005, we started to develop our online educational uh, modality. And uh, we created a, a unit in ASU, which we call Ed Plus. And Ed Plus is our ASU online, plus a lot of other experts who can ensure that the learning experience online is as equally engaging and rewarding and has the same outcomes as the learning experience uh, on our campus. And um, at, at the present time, we have about 60,000 students who are pursuing more than 200 full degrees online and, uh, and doing so very, very effectively. Um, the Wall Street Journal has uh, uh, named our students some of the most employable in the world. So we are very much uh, a believer in online education. But I think it's important to think about everything in between, right? Learning in this, in this, in this current age is, really operates along a continuum from the full campus immersion all the way up to the full online immersion. And in between are a number of hybrid options that, uh, that, that we can deploy so that students can take advantage of different modalities depending upon their best learning 
um, you know, experience. They're, they're, what, what makes them, helps them learn most effectively. Uh, so for example, we've recently opened an office in Los Angeles. And in that office, we've implemented a program called ASU Local. And that is for freshman students who can come to our campus and they can learn online, but with a, with a series of, with a, 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 um, a set of services that is offered there for them, including a lecturer uh, there on campus to help them progress. We have a staff of student success coaches that are constantly available over the telephone. And, uh, and as a result of that, they, they help students navigate and balance who are learning online, navigate and balance the work and life and family demands of a student, again, the non-traditional student that we can expect to see, I think, more commonly now as the world simply uh, needs to accommodate um, an opportunity for learning throughout uh, a student's lifetime. And we all, all of us on this call, I know that I certainly do, am constantly in a uh, learning mode. Um, obviously, when you write a book or you write an article, you're learning. Um, and, uh, excuse me. And so learning is, is critically important for all of us, and it's important for us to teach our students how to do that no matter where they are. And I think the, um, one of the keys to, and I'll talk about international students in a second, I do think that's a critically important, um, but one of the keys to effective online uh, or hybrid or some kind of blended modality, again, along that continuum, um, is to be sure that we're teaching our students how to navigate and be discerning in a world that is awash in information, right? Um, that is perhaps the most critical uh, thinking skill that we can teach. How does one distinguish and identify facts from non-facts, right? Uh, information in support of a thesis or a hypothesis. How does one think scientifically along the scientific method? and think critically about the information that's being provided to us on the internet. I think that is got to be the key skill that we teach young people. And I certainly try to learn that myself every day. I'm an addict, uh, like many of us are, uh, on, uh, to, to the internet and to the facts uh, and the information that I gain there. And I myself need to think very hard about being discerning in what I identify as truth and what I uh, can then can, can research and find out is not truthful. So that's, that's very, very important, I think. When it comes to international students, oh, um, let me just say one more thing about, about our, our continuum of learning. Um, I think we're gonna also have to think about how we leverage technology even more than we do today in, the, in light of coronavirus, leverage technology to take advantage of all the technological uh, advancements that we've seen. So clearly virtual reality is something we're already using in our laboratories uh, at ASU uh, to give students what feels like an in-person experience, but of course is, is not, but, is, but can be quite effective. One such uh, virtual reality online program we have is a space exploration program. And that space exploration program takes you in virtual reality to Mars. Um, you know, even before coronavirus, most of us were not going to be traveling to Mars. So, um, and so this virtual reality, no matter where we are, and regardless of the pandemic, um, can take the student to Mars. And while that student is standing on Mars, can help the student gauge the, uh, the gases in the atmosphere, uh, calculate the trajectory that it will take to get back to Earth, how much fuel it will require, what the geology is around, uh, around the student, pick up rocks and assess what a Martian rock looks like. Um, and so this is the kind of modality that we're gonna have to start thinking very hard about. How do we give students what feels like an in-person experience uh, that can be a very rewarding and enriching learning experience, uh, but can be done from anywhere. And space is a great, it's a great example of how we need to do that anyway. Um, the, other, the other kind of technology that we're trying to leverage at ASU is the robot. And I have a little video here I'm going to play for you uh, of how we used robots this year uh, at ASU to, um, to ensure that our students had some 
feeling of being at a graduation ceremony. So if, you, if, it, if this works for you, I'm gonna quickly share my screen here. And this is a video from YouTube, so I'm hoping that it will play effectively. Um, this is a news story from uh, a local news station, or, uh, or actually it's probably a national news station. And this uh, reporter is gonna tell us about how ASU managed its graduation ceremony. So let me play this and then uh, Gaurav, if you'll let me know if this does not play well. No, graduation ceremonies across the country have been either postponed or canceled. But Arizona State University's Thunderbird School of Global Management says the show must go on and they're doing it via robot. Tonight we hear from the school's dean and one of his soon to be graduates in their own words. We were really looking forward to come together and celebrate in person, walk on the stage. Um, so when we found out that it was canceled, it was a little disappointing. I got an email, congratulations, you won this award and somebody will get in touch with you for, because you'll be receiving the award via a robot. So that's all that was told me, like, really? Uh, okay, that sounds exciting. We knew it was a great experiment, uh, the Dean Folly, as I call it, but it turned out, I think, to be fantastic. We had a couple of practice sessions. All the students who are graduating uh, via robot get presented by me with their diplomas. Congratulations, Julie. We're so proud of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kodrama. It has a program involved, very easy to learn. They have taped the floor for us to know what path we are going to walk. Um, and if you played your car games uh, when you were a child on the computer, you know, the front back arrow jump, it's the same way. All you're doing is the front side back arrows to maneuver the robot. It was very fun, fascinating. And you felt like you're in the room. My parents wouldn't have been able to fly from India because of the lockdown and everything. And now they can, they get to see this sitting at their home in Mumbai. So I'm just super happy. Cool. So I, I, um, I'm proud of uh, what we've done there, uh, obviously. And they're uh, an Indian student whose parents couldn't come to graduation, but she got to experience it through a robot. So. Um, so I think that's the kind of innovation we're going to need to see uh, going forward. And in, in, in addition, in terms of international students, we are extremely focused on ensuring that our international students can continue their learning uh, path, uh, even if we can't get them to the United States. Um, we've done some studies in the U.S., and this may not apply in every nation, but certainly in the U.S., Missing a year uh, of your education and taking a gap year, well, that can be very beneficial in many ways, also can have a uh, substantial impact on lifelong, uh, lifelong uh, earnings. And so we wanna be sure that students can continue their education even if, uh, even if they can't get here or have difficulty getting their, their visas in time to start in August. We start August 20th this year for our fall semester. And so what we've done at ASU is, uh, for example, in our engineering school, where we have many, many thousands, actually, of Indian students who study engineering with us, uh, we, uh, we've created a system of staggered entry so that the students, depending upon when they get their visa, can come to the United States and then start learning in our synchronous uh, Zoom mode. And then when they get to the United States, they can then assimilate into a class immediately on our campus. And that enables any student, no matter where they are and when they can get to us, to start immediately in the campus classes when they arrive, but their learning can begin before they arrive. And we're doing this through a series of classes uh, that are synchronous, so using Zoom, and we are very sensitive. Uh, Dr. Gurinder, your point about time zones is, is extremely important. We're very sensitive to time zones, and so we've created a whole series of classes uh, for our freshmen and for others that will be taught at a time that is convenient for our students uh, who are 12 hours uh, differ differentiated from us. And so we, uh, we're very, uh, very sensitive to that. And we're also sensitive to the fact that students need to call their universities uh, and talk to uh, a, a student success person or an admissions officer and so we're trying to make sure that we have a cadre of staff members who are also available to talk, talk to students when they need to talk to us. We appreciate that technology, right, can always be a sticking point. 
Uh, Zoom, for example, doesn't work equally well everywhere in the world. And so we're gonna, we might have a situation in which our students are challenged by particular technological obstacles. And we wanna be sure that they have a chance to talk to us and overcome those obstacles. So, um, so thank you for, for, for noting that important fact to, to me. We, that's been something that I've been working on very hard lately is, uh, is making sure that our time zone, we're time zone sensitive to our thousands of international students who so sadly now may not be able to join us in the fall. But we are encouraging them to, to either take our asynchronous online learning classes or our, what we're calling ASU Sync, uh, which is a new terminology we're using to describe our Zoom classes that also involve uh, 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 all kinds of activities, student activities and other support services surrounding that Zoom class. Because it's important for us, for our students, uh, as you may know, our mascot is the Sun Devil. And so we want all of our Sun Devils, that's what we call our students, uh, to have uh, at least a simulated Sun Devil experience until they can arrive in person. Um, and also thinking about how we can bring our students together in country, in China, in India, and elsewhere uh, for enriching activities uh, so they can, they can meet our graduates who live in India and who are business professionals uh, or uh, meet our alumni who are in the medical field or whatever they happen to be studying so we can create some kind of events and experiences for them even in country. So that's, that's been a, a major focus of, of mine of late is thinking about our students who are far, far flung across the, the globe. We created a map recently of where all of our students are from. We have about 13,000 international students and they really are, uh, I think there's about 184 countries they come from and they really are in every single spot in the globe you can think of. Uh, so it's important for us to be sure that we serve them well, uh, even in the face of coronavirus. So, so I think uh, higher education is going to change and I wanna get your question, so I'll stop in a second. I think higher education is going to change substantially. I think it's gonna to have to pivot toward more technological uh, modality, technologically enhanced modalities. And it's interesting, I'll, I'll just point out that when this coronavirus hit, uh, only about half of American universities even had online classes. And so many universities were really taken by surprise. Some were not though, as I, as I mentioned earlier in, the, uh, in, in this quick talk, uh, there was a university that actually thought about this in advance. Um, the University of Illinois, about five years ago, actually uh, uh, took out an insurance policy on its international student enrollments because it appreciated that a jolt to the global system uh, could disrupt the international students from coming to the campus. And in many American universities, as you know, we're so grateful for our international students, but if you lose a quarter of your students, it's quite disruptive to your budget. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and, and there, the U.S. actually, it's just not students to fill up those seats from the U.S. And so, uh, so some, some schools, some universities were quite, had good foresight in thinking about what could happen uh, in the face of a, of a global disruption like we're experiencing right now. So, um, so I think it's important that universities now think this is likely to happen again, I think, uh, possibly. Let's, let's hope not, but it certainly could. And so we all have to think about how we're going to pivot quickly um, to, a, to a different, and to, to, frankly, to a different world. Th that, I'll just in conclusion, say that that is, uh, from my standpoint, as a global officer at a university and as a former dean of a school of international affairs, um, to me, the, the, the biggest challenge we face now um, is to ensure that we don't retrench on our, glo on our global approach to higher education. Um, it's easy in the face of a pandemic for nations to draw back, right, to, to uh, think more, more profoundly about how they, they want to develop bo borders that, that keep people out, right? Um, and that would be a great shame uh, for me. Our students benefit greatly, and I know our students who come from other foreign countries, as well as our American students on our campus, 
we, we really value the global experience that, that offers our students. If you walk around on campus at ASU, it doesn't look like, uh, it, 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 looks like a, it looks like people all over the world, and they are from all over the world, um, are there speaking multiple languages. That is truly what I think young people need. Um, I think it was Mark, T Mark Twain who said that one of the greatest antidotes to, to bigotry, to bias, is travel, right? When you travel and when you meet people from other cultures, it really does help you be far more broad-minded about the world. And, and I, am, I am deeply concerned that the coronavirus will cause us to reverse what I think is an extremely important trend for human beings, and that is the interaction that we have with others from around the world. And I must say, I benefit from this all the time personally because I travel so much, and my goodness, doesn't it give me a wonderful perspective on everything that I experienced in the U.S. as well, um, seeing, uh, uh, learning about just even simple things like food, right, and trying new foods is a way to keep my mind fresh. <laughs> so um, so I've, I'm very concerned that the coronavirus will, will cause uh, a reversal of this uh, globalization trend and I'm gonna work and do everything I can uh, and working as hard as I can to be sure that we maintain our global focus at ASU. So I've, I've given you a couple, I think, ideas about how we're thinking about the higher education in the time of coronavirus. I'm happy to take some questions and I look forward to that conversation. Since you have a hundred questions, I, I think that's probably wise for me to pause here and take those. Now, sir, please unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it was a brilliant uh, presentation and uh, the thoughts which you have shared. And uh, I, you have tried to already address uh, the question which one of our deans, uh, Dr. Colonel R.K. Dargan, uh, uh, has raised. Uh, in the chat box, uh, but I think that uh, he is reminding me that uh, another issue where he wants to have your opinion, and that is similar is the view of uh, one of, of our research scholars. Uh, and uh, uh, both of them, they are uh, reminding us that uh, uh, the times are have totally changed. So, uh, you know, the universities uh, will look very different. Uh, uh, these are very challenging times. Uh, students have a lot of stress on their mind. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of the students has uh, sent me uh, uh, a clipping from one of your newspapers, which appeared uh, yesterday. And it says that now till December 30th, uh, students will not be able to travel to US. So I think that there are restrictions on J1, on F1, yes. on H1B1. Yes. So yes. what do you foresee, you know, that uh, in, uh, uh, looking at the restrictions which have been imposed by the state, uh, how the, the, the international students uh, should look at U.S. Uh, from Indian angle, because this was the most preferred destination of Indian, in, of Indian students. So what is your advice? Uh, what do you feel that students should do now? So I think, I think uh, the way we're thinking about this, as we, as we work to support our, our Indian students and our international students, um, is to think carefully about whether or not a pause, right, in, um, in your education is, is the way to go. Certainly, we accept transfer credits at ASU. So if it, if it is most convenient for students to begin their education in, uh, in India and then come to the U.S. to finish, that's certainly feasible. But I definitely recommend that if students are thinking about doing that, that whatever school they want to come to in the U.S., of course, we welcome them at ASU, um, that they check to make sure those credits will transfer so they do not waste time and take courses where the credits won't count. So I think that's, that's very important. The second thing I would say for Indian students is to talk to, um, talk to the universities that you're thinking about going to and talk to them about how they plan to support you as a student and see what you think, right? I would definitely test those waters. So when we talk to our students, we talk about all the ways that we think that we can continue to support their learning journey, um, even if they can't get here right away. Appreciating that one of the critical factors that students take into account by coming to the U.S. is indeed the experience of being in US. We don't discount that. I understand how important that is. 
But certainly, if you want to get started, you can get started. And hopefully, Dr. Grinder, by the spring, we'll see considerable changes where students can come. And we're thinking about accommodating students in the summertime. They can do their OPT, uh, their optional practical training in the US, perhaps in the summer. Um, all kinds of different ways that we can readjust, even working with our Department of Education in the US to figure out ways that we can make adjustments to accommodate students. So if uh, there's interest in ASU for many of the members of this audience, uh, I certainly encourage you to get in touch with me. We have a wonderful, uh, is actually Indian, his name is Holly Singh, uh, who runs our International Student Center. And he could provide uh, any students who have inquiries, among others at ASU, uh, about how we plan on, on, on pr providing support. There's a lot of skepticism in the world, and I think this is true really anywhere, uh, about what you can learn online. And we have done um, studies, so we have in our Ed Plus unit that I mentioned, we have something called an action lab. We call it the action lab, but it's really a statistical analysis center, a big data center. And we analyze learning outcomes from our online classes that we have, where we have exactly the same class on ground, right? So we have a perfect experimental laboratory for us and real world laboratory. And we test whether or not the learning outcomes for students are equal across those two different methods of delivery. And we find that students learn extremely well. And the, the, the letters I receive from time to time from our online students, whether they're master's students or undergrads, about how much they love the online classes um, is, 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 is so heartwarming. And they love them not only because they can learn at their own pace in many circumstances, right? Not hemmed in by a particular schedule, um, but also because we're very good at ASU at delivering online with very high production values. And that's very important to young people these days. They're very good themselves at making their own movies and YouTube videos and everything else that young people can do. Their PowerPoint presentations really put mine to shame. They're unbelievable. Um, and so they expect a high, high level of quality and we are, we are very intent upon delivering that. So, um, so I, I do think students should think hard, understanding that there's some skepticism, but try it, you might find it truly uh, rewarding. So. Thank you. I think uh, brilliant uh, answer. Uh, uh, we have got about uh, 20 uh, odd questions related with the admissions uh, in American universities and uh, quite a few students who were uh, giving SAT this time and then a few who were giving GRE and GMAT. They are asking this question that most of the US universities now they are saying that they will not accept SAT score or, or GRE scores or GMAT scores. So on what basis they will be assessing the applications and what about uh, Arizona State University? Uh, 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 do you take SAT or uh, if a student wants to take admission uh, in AS, uh, ASU next year? Uh, uh, so what, you, what is your advice? Will you take the SAT scores, GRE scores, GMAT score? or there is something else which you will look in the application? Yeah, so as far as I know, uh, and I'm sorry I'm not completely up to speed, if we've changed uh, the, this, we certainly have in the past, um, that's been uh, one of the criteria that we use. I know that some, uh, uh, and so I'm happy to follow up with you for your students and for the members of our, our audience here this morning, if there's some change to that. But I do know that American universities are really rethinking their admission standards. Pardon me. And the reason is because they have come to realize, at least in the U.S., that some of the uh, standardized tests that are taken uh, in the U.S. are actually in some ways biased against certain segments of the population. And so they want to think uh, more. Plus, it's expensive and uh, SATs are often students can do well if they can afford to take an SAT preparation course, but not everyone can afford it. So I think universities are concerned about income inequality, about ensuring that students who don't have uh, substantial uh, family resources can still go to college. And so the alternative, of course, is to look holistically at the students' experiences, at their accomplishments, at, their, uh, at, their, at the grades in high school, acknowledging, of course, that different high schools grade differently. Um, you, have to, you have to be very educated about the high schools, et cetera, or the colleges 
around the world if you're going to take this holistic approach. Um, but I do think it's wise to think hard about whether the tests that we're giving are actually measuring uh, what we need to measure and aren't advantaging certain segments of the population because they have more money. And by the way, that is one thing that very much concerns us at ASU about the coronavirus is that it, we don't want it to exacerbate income inequality in the US um, because students who are otherwise not able to go to college because now they have less money and uh, less resources uh, as the economies shrink. Um, we're thinking very hard about how we ensure that they can still continue to receive an education. So, um, so yeah, so in terms of the specific uh, criteria, as far as I know, they haven't changed at ASU, but, um, but I'm happy to respond to specific questions. And incidentally, for those of you who are out there in the audience, I can't see you, but my email is sl at asu.edu, just sl at asu.edu. By all means, do email me and I'll forward your query to whomever at ASU wants to answer your question or can answer your question. Okay. Thank you. I think that, uh, that would be very helpful. And uh, 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 Ankit is adding to this question and uh, this is uh, in our question box. Uh, and uh, he's saying that what about work after graduation? Uh, you know that uh, most of the students who were going uh, from India to US uh, after studying there, they were working for a while and then coming back or starting their own ventures. So his question is, what about working after graduation? Uh, if I go to a US university and then study there, uh, do you think that we will be, we, we might not get to work there even if we get admission into one of the universities? Uh, though I differ uh, uh, with you, Ankit, but I leave it to, uh, uh, to the Professor Stepani to answer your question. Uh, 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 so what is your view? Well, so the, the, there's two, two ways to think about this question. One is, will the economic uh, situation in the U.S. be sufficiently robust to, uh, to accommodate um, uh, students working in U.S. industry? And um, that, of course, I don't have a crystal ball on. Um, I think that's something that we're all watching very carefully. And the U.S. government is uh, very, as I know the Indian government is, very focused on ensuring that our economy remains afloat. <laughs> um, we learned a lot from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And so I hope that many of those lessons can be put into effect now and to sustain our economy going forward. Um, and so I think that's, that's an open question, and I'm, I'm very hopeful, though. I'm hopeful that the engine of the U.S. economy will continue to chug along and be able to absorb uh, young people from around the world as they come here to study and also to work. In terms of uh, optional practical training, we are focused like a laser beam on that at, a at ASU. We appreciate the importance of that for students when they come over uh, to the United States. That is an added benefit to them that we understand is critical to the entire learning experience. And so um, one way we're addressing that uh, at ASU is we're making sure that students who need optional practical training can do it in a, in a variety of different settings and also even work at ASU. So we're developing some jobs for students at the university. Of course, we have a gigantic university with all kinds of different uh, units that do business, frankly. We have accelerators and we have uh, corporate entities that we've created um, and so we um, we're, we're very focused and we have laboratories we're developed that we just developed a saliva test in our biodesign institute for coronavirus so that we can all just spit into a cup uh, to uh, receive a test um, and so there's lots of places um, that we're hoping that we can place some students as well even at ASU so I think that's a great question uh, for your particular uh, department or school, if you're interested in coming to ASU to talk to the student support people um, in those institutions and find out how OPT is going. But we greatly appreciate the value of that to our students. And I think um, it's why our students uh, often succeed so well. Um, we're also, one final thing on this point is, I, I've been talking to a lot of people in Africa and elsewhere um, who are concerned about jobs when they graduate. Let's say you get a master's degree in engineering, but there's no job for you when you graduate. Well, one thing we're also thinking uh, about at ASU is making sure that all of our students have the opportunity to learn entrepreneurial skills. 
small business, right? And starting your own business is really uh, what drives, th those, those small businesses drive the U.S. economy for sure. Um, and it, it is uh, on the trajectory of a nation building exercise, small, small business is critical. And so we really, we have all kinds of laboratories and change maker spaces and, and uh, working laboratories for engineers to come together with lawyers and business uh, students to learn about how to establish their own business. And I think that's something that students um, think about themselves already. A lot of them already you know, start businesses when they're in college. Um, and so that's also an important part of this, of this uh, puzzle that you've, you've asked me about. And uh, this is a question from one of your alumni uh, who has done a master's uh, at Thunderbird Business School. Great, hi, a T-bird. Yeah, so, uh, so she is, uh, her name is Meenu Sharma. She uh, now heads uh, a company in India. And uh, she works uh, uh, at a, as a vice president uh, 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 with uh, Siemens India. And uh, wow. she's a Christian, uh, and she's saying that uh, uh, one of my family member wants to do uh, uh, the BS program uh, uh, in America. And uh, uh, they are considering the Thunderbird uh, again as a most uh, uh, preferred choice of theirs. But then she's saying that they will not be able to come this year as the, uh, till December, in any case, there is a restriction now, and they are not very sure that by when they will be able to go. And uh, 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 they are asking that uh, uh, if they do a first part of the program in India, uh, let's say at MIT, uh, because uh, uh, she has all she's also alumni, alumni of MIT, so she has done that. Uh, oh, great, great, great! Uh, so we have got a partnership. So she's saying that if I do, uh, 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 if uh, the member of my family is doing a part of the program in India, uh, let's say first year in India okay. at MIT. Will they be getting uh, uh, the similar credits uh, which otherwise they had to earn in the first year at Thunderbird or uh, how you will map the courses? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the graduate school at ASU, I think Thunder, the Thunderbird program is a two-year program. And so if you ended up doing the first year uh, in India, that would still leave the second year for you to, um, to, to, to have in the United States. And incidentally, um, is Ms. Sharma, is it Sharma? Is, is, that Ms., is Ms. Sharma, that's who I'm talking to, I think. Um, Thunderbird is building a new, new, new building. I don't know if you knew that, um, but that building will be open, I think in 2021 or early 2022. So your sister or family member who's thinking about coming to Thunderbird will be in a brand new, very tech, tech, tech savvy, interesting building, so down in downtown Phoenix. Um, so that's exciting. The, the, back to the transfer credit issue or question. Um, the graduate school at ASU in a master's program accepts up to 12 credits in transfer credit. Uh, and so, that's the, so that would be a semester's worth of work. The other part of the work might be done effectively online so that you could have a mix, right? Do some of it at Amity, some of it online to be sure the credits transfer in and then come over to the US and then continue the program here. Um, there may be exceptions to this rule. Uh, so I think it's important for, uh, for whomever's interested in coming to talk to Thunderbird and find out exactly what they're willing to uh, work with you on. But the, the general rule is 12 credits transfer in into a graduate uh, program. So, um, so but, the, the, but Thunderbird has many, many courses online and so and, and, and of course as does ASU so there's lots of things you can do uh, online to continue the education and then get here in, this, in uh, 2021 if necessary and we'd welcome <laughs> thank you with open arms uh, and there is a, another question uh, uh, which Akshita uh, Koshal I think it's on your screen also she is asking two questions uh, first is uh, uh, that how uh, to what extent uh, 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 corona virus uh, is impacting the modes of teaching and learning in higher education. And then our second question is that how do senior management uh, encourage students to learn in higher institutions of education? Yeah. Um, so the first question is how is it impacting? Well, gigantically at, 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 and even at ASU that was already online. So for example, we're re retrofitting about 200 of our classrooms to offer 360 degree Zoom experience. So this involves 
about $35,000 of equipment to uh, bring microphones. They, they, they dangle from the ceiling. Um, the video can completely surround so that if you're, if you're not in Phoenix, you can have a full in-classroom feel to your Zoom experience. Um, that's the kind of thing that, uh, is, is, that we're working on at ASU to adapt to a, a, this different environment. We really need to simulate uh, uh, as much as we can that classroom experience while supplementing it with other online experiences. Um, and we, uh, at, at ASU, what we realized is that testing, at least for the foreseeable future, testing is going to be extremely important. Um, in addition to masks and sh face shields for faculty members, you know, we're dealing with some of these issues really on a day-to-day -day basis. Face shields are wonderful because you can speak as a faculty member behind a face shield, but they shine, right? So since they shine, they can blur, or obscure, as my glasses are doing now <laughs> to you, um, they can blur and obscure the face uh, for a video. So we're really thinking about how do you address these very nitty gritty details that make the experience differ uh, for students depending upon where they are. So very carefully assessing these, these points. But back to the testing, we realize that, that to make students feel comfortable being on, on campus and our faculty, you know, we have a lot of octogenarians, septuagenarians who are teaching with us, and they are concerned about coming onto campus. Um, and so we're, we developed in our laboratories this saliva test because we knew we could give that at any time and a student or a faculty member can get a test when they, when they need it, when they want it, um, and feel more confident. So I think that's also, uh, uh, universities are gonna have to realize that their research engines um, are, are, need to come and be deployed, right? And we've seen this around the world, obviously, to help address this particular problem. Um, as for your second part of your question on what can leaders do to help promote education? Well, I hope I'm doing something now. This is the kind of thing I think, talking to you, making you aware that uh, that leaders in higher education, I know Dr. Barinder and Gaurav, everybody here on this call is, is very focused on ensuring that students continue to learn. The other thing that I try to do is model um, learning, right? Um, even though I'm a senior vice president and I do a lot of uh, work man helping manage uh, ASU's gigantic global portfolio, I still teach and I still write. I'm writing a book now about an incident in American constitutional history involving a bridge over the Ohio River. There was a big litigation over it in uh, 1852. Um, so I'm, I continue my own intellectual journey uh, and I couldn't survive without it. <laughs> um, I, learning and continuous learning is what keeps us frankly young. Um, and I'm not young anymore. Uh, after hearing my bio, I realize I've been quite around the block a number of times, but my mind, uh, fortunately, I hope is as flexible and as adaptable as ever been because I constantly use it. Thank you. So, Pushal, uh, learning never stops. And I'm sure uh, uh, that uh, you are being guided by your mentors, by your university, very uh, rightly perceived by uh, Professor Stephanie. There's other question which our Vice President uh, Anil Choudhury, uh, Mr. Anil Choudhury is asking. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that uh, there are a lot of students uh, and thousands of students who were studying in the US, they had to come quite early. Uh, by 20th March, they, they suddenly took a flight and then they are back in, uh, in their home country in India and elsewhere in the world. So uh, how US universities are helping them? Uh, to uh, to make sure that they get similar kind of inputs uh, which they would have uh, got if they were in in US, and uh, uh, what is their future now? Do you think that they will be able to fly back to US, uh, as uh, you know that most of the US universities will be uh, will not be able to take foreign students now uh, till December, and some of them they were in the final year. Uh, so, yeah. what is your advice to them? to these students who had to come back, but they want to go back to, to, to US also? Well, we want them back, uh, but um, it's obvious, pardon me, obviously the case that, oh, and, and in actual fact, we ended up with thousands of students who stayed in the US. So those students, uh, we enriched their experience over the summer. We realized they would have felt, you know, they might've liked to have gone home for the summer, but they couldn't. 
Uh, and so they stayed and we provided them with six Sigma classes and a number of other, of other opportunities for them to continue um, enriching their, their minds. Um, but now we are faced with a situation where a student might have one year left and they can't get back to the US. And at ASU, we're fairly well prepared to manage that because we have so many of our degrees already online that uh, we can offer them the option to, to finish their degrees in online classes or ASU sync, as we're calling it, synchronous classes. Um, because it's, it, it, the, we, the worst thing that can happen to a student, uh, well, it's not the worst thing, but it's not a, 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 not a good outcome for a student not to finish their degree, right? The degree is the critical solution. Now, the, uh, to, to, really, it's the solution to economic mobility, right? Having that degree uh, and using that to, to uh, advance uh, one's career. So, um, so we are thinking very hard about working with a personalized learning program for each student who can't come back to make sure that they can continue and finish their degrees uh, online if necessary, and then participate in a robot graduation ceremony, perhaps, if necessary. Um, but th that is a, it's a real challenge, and it requires, in my, in my humble opinion, it requires almost a personalized approach from the university to each student. And that's what we've been working on in our department since colleges and schools reaching out to each student and saying, what do you need and how, how are we going to support you to succeed? Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions on scholarships. Uh, and I think that uh, Mr. Gaurav and uh, Professor Cutter also have a lot of questions with them. Uh, but I will very quickly ask one question on scholarship and then I will leave it to uh, Mr. Bhattagar and uh, Professor Cutter to ask questions. Uh, this question pertains to a scholarship and uh, uh, this is a very young girl who's asking this question and she's saying, uh, I'm 18 year old, I want to do BS in US, uh, but I know that I need to do now, uh, maybe for a year or two uh, in my home country, uh, doing uh, on e-learning portals, but are there any scholarships or fee discounts which I will be getting? We are, uh, we are working on scholarships for this, given this situation. So yes, if she's particularly interested in, in ASU, which we would encourage her to be, um, if she could contact our admissions office or contact me uh, via the email that I already offered to you, and I will forward the inquiry to our admissions office, um, who can work with her on this uh, financial aid and the scholarship, because obviously that's something that if you, if you can't come to the U.S., there's savings there, but, um, but there may be other scholarships available. So by all means, do, do contact us and I can give you the details. I, it's, it's, it's an individualized decision as I, as I understand it, but I can certainly put her in, in contact with, uh, with the, the personnel that can help her with that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lindquist. I think uh, very apt answers to those uh, questions. Uh, we just have one question here from uh, one of our uh, students uh, from the Singapore campus. Uh, you know, she says that uh, pandemic as it started, uh, you know, well, everyone just thought of that it shuttered economies and uh, there will be a lot of negative impact. But at the same time, it has opened up new challenges, new opportunities. And, uh, you know, looking at the video that you just showed, uh, I think that is one of the disruptive innovations uh, for, for a graduation ceremony. So she asked that, uh, you know, how COVID-19, is it actually driving a long overdue revolution in education? Or do you think that we are going to go back to our normal state of affairs uh, once the pandemic is over? I absolutely think it's driving a, a major revolution in higher education. Um, it, it want, in one way, I think that's going to have an effect is that schools that can scale, right, that can achieve economies of scale, that can welcome more students will survive because they're gonna have a more flexible financial model, whereas very small colleges, now Amity is a great example of that, right? A large multi-campus institution. Um, the uh, uh, small colleges in the US, the prediction is that's, that, that small liberal arts colleges who have 1,000 or 2,000 students are gonna face particular challenges. And so I think we're gonna see a, a shifting of, uh, the, in, the, in the higher education market among schools and colleges. We'd even seen some closures in the US prior to coronavirus because the financial model for a very small institution is difficult to, uh, to maintain um, with very small numbers of students who support 
an otherwise fairly expensive faculty. Faculty members, you know, get paid a reasonable amount of money. So that so that's that's already happening. I think we're going to see a lot of mergers. Uh, Thunderbird was a merger, right? Thunderbird came to ASU uh, as a merger. It was a standalone institution, and then fortunately for us, and we hope fortunately for Thunderbird, um, it became part of the ASU family. Um, and that was really because the small standalone business school is hard to maintain financially in the U.S. So it's been our great uh, pleasure to have Thunderbird part of our, our team. Um, so I do think there's a lot of changes. The other thing uh, that, that, will, that will take place, the other thing is I think we're getting used to a couple of, of important developments under COVID. Um, we're, we're first of all getting used to Zoom and how effective it can be. It's tiring. I'm on Zoom uh, about eight hours a day, typically with meetings, and I find it exhausting because you're you're really focused in on a screen. So it, it, it takes a different kind of energy. But I think we're getting very used to the flexible and adaptable um, modality that it is. You can do it pretty much anywhere, and and I think that is a great lesson for higher education that it doesn't have to be rigid, sort of students and seats, but really can be done along a different time, uh, uh, in different delivery modalities. So that's, that's important. And the other thing I think is that coronavirus is really helping us appreciate the value of clean air, right? I mean, in Phoenix, uh, when I've dri driven around Phoenix before coronavirus, um, you look out over Phoenix and you can see a haze over the city. There's no haze there anymore. And I think that um, we're going to, we're, we're going to really, I hope the human, the, the, the humankind will wake up and say, hey, not only is this uh, a wake up call on how we interact with animal species, um, certainly because coronavirus is sourced through our interactions with, with animal species um, and caring for our animal brethren, right, out there in the world and being more careful about how we interact with animals, but also the importance of a clean environment. And boy, it's wonderful. I've seen pictures of Delhi, right, where suddenly there's a blue sky. And it's just, you know, that's, that I think is a real, is, I hope, I hope has helped people appreciate the value of a sustainable environment. Thank you, Professor Linkwist. I think uh, the very word is sustainable. And yes, uh, as humankind, we have to understand that uh, whether a pandemic or no pandemic, uh, we have to uh, live in a certain way, which helps our environment, which helps us and helps our kids. Uh, you know, there are a lot of questions which are pouring in, but due to the paucity of time, we'll just take one final question. So I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Cutter, uh, who's joined us as another panelist from our Amity International Business School. So uh, Dr. Cutter, over to you to ask the final question. So yeah, nice uh, to meet you, Dr. Cutter. Uh, uh, thank you, Gaurav, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, let me congratulate you Professor Stephanie for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I really liked your you know, covering of how the, uh, uh, the technology was, has been leveraged during this uh, last two or three months. Uh, I think so you spoke at length and uh, I think so that video was wonderful uh, where uh, great innovative effort by the university, right? For the graduation ceremony. I think so the uh, uh, smile on the face of the student said it all. It must have been a great success, right? Uh, then you also spoke about you know how these two, how, how you're ensuring that students who are yet to join, how that entire process, right? You are trying to cover up in these uh, times of uncertainty. Uh, I have a lot of research on quality aspect, right? So uh, like uh, most of the universities switched over to this uh, so-called virtual mode, right? Initially, quite a few who were not prepared, right? So they were still stabilizing, I, uh, but over a period of time, I think so, most of the universities did get it correct, right? Uh, in spite of all this, all this technology and all, I think so, the atmosphere of the class, you know, it is made up of, you know, a physical presence, that emotional aspect, which I, I don't think so, any virtual world can, you know, overcome that. So I think so, uh, we may speak about technology, do you think the aspect of quality suffered in this because of two or three aspects which are just bought out? You know, uh, unless you have that real feel, you know, you can't see that uh, reaction on the face of student, the way he or she is asking, and I as a faculty member replying to that. You know, so that full atmosphere is different in a class and than what is in a virtual board. 
So I think so. This does have an effect on quality. And what is your take on this? And uh, I'm sure this this probably uh, virtual mode might continue into some more time into the year. So how do you try? Uh, uh, what are the ways you think that we can get in more aspects of quality in our communities? Thank you. That was great. I really appreciate your question, Dr. Cotter, because you know human beings are social animals. Uh, we we thrive on being around other human beings. Um, it's kind of like dogs. You know, I have a bunch of dogs. I have three dogs in my house. They're pack animals. They they really they 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 really don't care about me so much. They like each other, <laughs> and um, and so human beings are the same. You know, we we really do thrive on that interpersonal uh, uh, interaction, and so I don't want to minimize that. There's no that, that there's no question that that is, an, is, is important and valuable uh, to young people, to all people. And, and so I don't want to be a Pollyanna and say that that's not, that's not important. And for many people, it is. And so we're not getting it at all now, right? At least I've been in my house isolated uh, for months now. And so it's, that's, that's, that's very challenging, whether you're in education or not. And I, I think that's um, you know, something we, d we definitely have to address. Um, in terms of what you can do online, I, 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 I heard one person say uh, when the coronavirus hit that the coronavirus will either, either be the best thing for online education or the worst thing. It'd be the worst thing if it was done poorly, right? And if it, um, if it uh, uh, sort of poisoned people's view of what can be done online. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so I, if, I really do think it is important that it be done well. Uh, so that if you want to, you know, expand into that modality in the future in some kind of hybrid blended model, it can be done effectively. Um, and I think that faculty have to adapt. So, for example, online, it's not the same in terms of giving an exam as it is in person. In person, you can put a piece of paper in front of a student. You can ensure that they're not looking at any other materials. And if, 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 if memorizing certain things is important to you as a faculty member, you can ensure they are actually doing that work. Whereas online, it's a little more difficult to track a student's uh, activities. We have monitors that we use in our online classes for exams and things like that. But it really requires a faculty member to shift in how they're conducting assessments so that an assessment is a creative exercise that can't simply be copied from the internet, but actually requires the student to take the information from the class, assimilate it, and, create a, and, and produce a creative product that is unique to that student. So assessments have to be done differently. Um, and, and I think that is actually a more effective way to do an assessment, right? I don't think memorization can be important in some fields, but really what we care about is what's the, what, what are the, how are the wheels turning and using those tools to actually produce something new, discovery, right, of your own ideas. Um, so I think, I think we have to, to shift um, in how we conduct assessments. We're also, in terms of that one-on-one -on -one experience, we're, we're, we are uh, having a large um, conference. It's called uh, Remote. Let me put the... Um, let me put the link. It's a free conference. We already have thousands of, of uh, faculty members who are joining us. And the whole point of the conference is to, um, is to help faculty members enhance the experiences you're describing, right? You're never going to be able to necessarily, uh, let me put this in the So I just, I just posted that in the, in the chat room. Um, strongly encourage your faculty and students to join us for this. There are numerous sessions throughout two days. They're time zone friendly, by the way, in the afternoon or evening, we've tried to, or early morning, we've tried to work to make sure that times were convenient for people around the world. And there are sessions on different disciplines. So how do you teach dance online, right? There's a good question. How do you teach uh, visual arts or art online? How do you teach political science online? So looking at each discipline and thinking about creative ways to enhance the experience for students. So I really strongly encourage if, if your faculty have time to join us. I'm sure there's some business. I think you said you're a business faculty member. I think there's, there's business sessions and all kinds of other uh, disciplines there. Thank you so That's much for asking. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Over to Gaurav. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Linquist. 
And, uh, you know, I must uh, congratulate you for some of the unique terms that you've used and so apt, uh, such as the, the remote conference, the ASU uh, sync and, and many others, which just shows the digitization uh, of higher education in, in this pandemic. And uh, as you rightly uh, mentioned that, yes, there are opportunities uh, in these areas. There are, uh, there are a lot to think about. And at the same time, uh, we have to keep innovating. We have to keep uh, bringing in uh, disruptive uh, innovations, which are unique to help the students, to help uh, faculties, and uh, to see higher education uh, grow even more and more. And I'm sure as we go along, uh, Amity, along with uh, the Arizona State University, will be in many, many uh, uh, collaborations together as we go along and see uh, you know, and developing some of these disruptive innovations together. So once again, I thank you for coming onto this platform and taking this very, very pertinent topic, higher education in the times of COVID and, uh, you know, enlightening us, our students, our faculty members with some thought provoking, uh, with this thought provoking session and some wonderful statements that you've made. And I also thank uh, Professor Dr. Gurinder Singh Sir, our group vice chancellor, uh, you know, his presence in these webinars are motivating and it is just, uh, you know, it just shows how he leads from the front and how he motivates us and challenges us to go beyond and beyond every time. So I thank you once again, uh, all the faculty members and the students who have joined us and to the IT team and to these platforms in wonderful platforms, the Zooms and the WebExes of the world, which has actually became uh, the, the lifelines, the backbone of higher education. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. I know Amity's a real disruptor, and I'm 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 very very impressed to, with the with this uh, webinar. And I thank you very very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Gurinder. Thank you, Parav. Thank you, Dr. Cotter. Wonderful to meet you, and thanks to all of the viewers. Really great to meet you too. Hope to see you soon in, in Arizona if you can if you can get here, and I hope you can. Absolutely, Professor Stepani, and I think that there are a number of questions uh, uh, which are still with us. We will send you the summary of these questions and. Uh, great. Uh, your email is with all the participants and uh, your session is also we are uh, putting it on our website so if anyone wants to again see it or if they have questions maybe that they can always reach to you through us uh, and uh, also to all the listeners i think that uh, 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 the days uh, are going to be very bright very soon uh, as you know that uh, we are the largest importer from united states largest exporter to united states and if you look at the data Last year, 13% of the research scholars uh, in all the American universities, they are from the Indian origin. About 17% of the CEOs, uh, which uh, run Fortune 500 companies and who are uh, doing very well in Silicon Valley, they are from the Indian origin. Uh, all the universities there, they, they actually value uh, Indian students quite a lot. And uh, during my visits to Arizona State University and to the Thunderbird Business School, uh, I saw uh, their faculty celebrating uh, Indian week. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the days are going to be very bright. So uh, of course, there are six, seven months which are uh, difficult. But I think the most of the US universities, they are accepting the credits of the, of the universities. And uh, MIT has taken a step forward. Uh, we are uh, requesting all the American universities to accept the credits, uh, which Indian students will be earning in their first two years. And I'm sure uh, that all of you will have an American experience. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Professor Stephanie, on behalf of our chancellor, on behalf of our founder, on behalf of uh, our all vice presidents, deans, and 175,000 uh, strong family members of uh, MIT. We once again, uh, from the bottom of our heart, we thank you for the time that you have taken. Uh, uh, we look forward to welcoming you in one of our MIT campus in the times to come. Stay safe. Course, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you.